Cindy Monkman met a charming German man in a bar one night, and the two began dating. But when his visa was about to expire and he suggested a green card marriage, Cindy thought she was helping him out. What she didn't know was that this was part of a plot that started before they even met. I'm Charlie, and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to Crime Lines. We are in December. I can hardly believe it. I do want to send a quick shout out to my good friend Haley Gray, who researched this episode. I have people reach out to me all the time to see how they can get into the field of researching for true crime podcasts. And I actually finally have a decent answer for you. Haley hasn't just researched for top true crime shows like Southern Fried True Crime, My Favorite Murder, Already Gone, Big Mad True Crime, and so many others. She has a course now designed to help people learn how to do what she does. I'm going to leave a link in the show notes to her website if you're interested in it. Definitely check it out because I do think it's probably the best way to get into researching for true crime podcasts without having already been a podcaster yourself. But for now, let's go ahead and get into today's case. And it starts with Cynthia Estelle Monkman, who was born in Pensacola, Florida in 1958. Cindy did not stay an only child for long, though. Her sister Kathy came less than a year and a half later, and then about two years after that, their brother John Jr. was born. The family moved to the Chicago area, where their mother Dorothy was from, in 1965. Within months of moving there, the family suffered a major loss when Dorothy died of cancer at the age of 36 leaving behind three children who were only seven, five, and three at the time. Now, I'm not saying that I fully buy into birth order theory, but if you look up the traits of a firstborn child, you'll read a description of Cindy, and probably even more so after her mother's death. She was outgoing and driven, described as a natural leader who was full of energy. She attended Illinois State University for her undergrad, studying nutrition, and then got her master's in community health from Western Illinois University. In the early 1980s, Cindy's younger sister Kathy moved to Arizona to attend nursing school, and Cindy decided to move there with her, quickly finding work as a nutrition counselor while waiting tables for extra income. The sisters were young and on their own, so they loved to go out, even taking trips together. Cindy started dating a man named Mark, and she was left crushed when their relationship ended. So she was still pretty raw and vulnerable in October of 1988 when she met Michael Apelt. Now, I imagine his first name is really pronounced the German way since he was from Germany and all, but every report I can find says Michael. So it is possible he switched to the anglicized version when he came to the U.S., which is not uncommon, and I'm going to go ahead and use that because does anyone really want to hear my poorly pronounced German C-H combination for the next hour? I don't think so. Anyway, back on track. Cindy met Michael through her friend Annette, who had met both Michael and his brother Rudy at a bar in Mesa, Arizona, in early October 1988. The two brothers were dressed sharply, which got Annette's attention, as did their accents. Michael and Rudy had just moved to the U.S. from Germany that year, and Michael did most of the talking because Rudy's English skills were pretty basic. Michael said that he worked in IT for a Fortune 500 company, and Rudy was in banking. Annette talked to them for a bit and then gave Rudy her phone number, which he made a use of two days later. He asked if she wanted to go out that night with him and Michael, so Annette invited Cindy and Kathy to go with her. Cindy and Michael hit it off right away, and Michael spent that night just showering her with attention. This wasn't something new to Cindy as she was very attractive, but she was also as equally as entranced with Michael. He told her that they had come to the U.S. for work and they were staying at the local Holiday Inn while they got themselves established in the area. The very night they met, Michael started making comments about wanting to marry Cindy one day, which she took as flattery and not necessarily an indication of serious intent. 
Over the course of the next week, Annette and Rudy paired off, as did Cindy and Michael, and the couple saw each other a number of times in that first week. One night, though, after the guys had been over to Cindy's apartment, she noticed that about $100 in cash had seemingly walked off. She and Annette talked, and they were suspicious. They had barely met these men, and now money was missing. They needed to look a little bit more into things. The first thing they did was call the Holiday Inn and asked about the men. They found out that they weren't actually staying there. Instead, through their little investigative skills, they learned that the men were actually staying in the much cheaper Motel 6 that was nearby. This Motel 6 was definitely not the type of place a Fortune 500 company or an international bank would put their very important employees. So the next time the women saw Michael and Rudy, they confronted them about the lie, which they initially denied. They said they were definitely staying at the Holiday Inn and there must have been some confusion with the front desk. They even had Annette and Cindy drop them off at the Holiday Inn at the end of the night. Knowing the men were probably lying, the women then drove to the Motel 6 and got their room number. They knocked on the door and a woman answered. She was Anka Dorn, who Michael and Rudy would tell the women was the wife of a friend who was in the hospital. They were just letting her stay with them in the meantime. Now, the truth was that she was Michael's ex-girlfriend who had traveled with them from Germany. And I say ex-girlfriend, but the ex part is debatable. Michael and Rudy also managed to convince Annette and Cindy that the deception about where they were staying was actually part of their work. Due to their security clearance, they were not allowed to disclose their actual location. But thanks to Annette and Cindy finding out, they actually got fired. This meant their work visas would expire very soon if they didn't find new jobs. And without the visas, they would have to leave the country. Cindy and Annette took the men at their word and felt awful about what happened. They had no intention of costing them their jobs, so Annette and Cindy asked if there was something they could do to fix things. Maybe they could help them find new jobs or even talk to their bosses about what happened and get them their old jobs back. Neither man seemed very interested in those offers, so Annette joked, what do you want us to do, marry you? This question, asked in jest, ended up leading to a genuine conversation about green card marriages. Rudy assured Annette that he really did love her, and if they got married at the beginning of their relationship, it didn't mean they wouldn't be together forever. It would just let him stay in the U.S. while they continued to see each other. Otherwise, he would have to go back to Germany, and that would be the end of things. For several days, Rudy stayed at Annette's apartment as they discussed this, but it just wasn't sitting right with her. She eventually figured out that Anka wasn't the wife of a friend, and though she wasn't exactly sure who she was, she just knew it was one more lie she caught Rudy in. She told him to leave and not come back, and that was the last she saw of him. Cindy, however, kept seeing Michael, who said Anka and Rudy were facing deportation as their visas were expiring. Deportation would mean they could not come back to the U.S. for a period of time, so they wanted to fly home voluntarily before that happened. But they didn't have enough money for the flights, so Cindy helped pay for their tickets home. Now, Michael took this money and never bought the tickets. Rudy and Anka were holed up in the motel room, enjoying the money Cindy had given them under false pretenses. Just as Rudy and Annette had conversations about a green card marriage, it seemed like Cindy and Michael did as well. But these conversations went better for Michael than they did for Rudy. About three weeks after meeting, on October 28, 1988, 30-year-old Cindy Monkman and 25-year-old Michael A. Pelt eloped to Las Vegas. The marriage was kept mostly a secret at that point because it really was for the sake of the visa, so they carried on as though they were still just dating, though Michael more or less lived at her apartment. Michael was the type of guy Cindy was looking for, or at least he presented himself that way. He was affectionate and good-looking, and he seemingly adored her. 
Cindy had taken him at face value because she was someone who was really smart, but also kind of naive when it came to relationships. Her journal did show, though, that there were some cracks in their relationship, with her writing that she felt as if she was in the twilight zone with him. She loved him, but she wasn't sure she could trust him. And that gut feeling that things were not quite right with her new husband was spot on. A week and a half after the wedding, Michael talked to Cindy about getting life insurance. He explained that it was a normal investment practice in Germany for new couples to invest their money in insurance. And given that Michael was financially savvy, or at least claimed to be, Cindy trusted his advice in financial matters. The two met with an insurance agent who later said that Michael suggested a million-dollar policy on Cindy. He knew right away that that was well above what they would qualify for, so the agent suggested a much more reasonable but still high number, 400000 To put that into modern perspective, that's about a million dollars in today's money. Along with the application, Cindy paid the first premium payment. What she didn't know was that she also completed one more step in a conspiracy between Michael, Rudy, and allegedly Anka that started before Cindy was even in the picture. So let's go ahead and back up to August of 1988 when Rudy and Michael, ages 28 and 25, flew from Germany to San Diego. With them was Anka Dorn and also Rudy's wife, Susanna. Yes, he was already married. While the brothers were out at a club one night, they met two women, Cheryl and Trudy, who were in San Diego for a party. They gave Rudy and Michael their numbers and also their addresses in Phoenix, Arizona, which is where they lived. Rudy and Michael called the women and made arrangements to come to Phoenix to visit about two weeks after they met. Cheryl picked them up at the airport and brought them to the Holiday Inn where they said they were going to stay, and instead they walked over to the Motel 6. They spent a few weeks in Phoenix before they went back to San Diego to get Anka. Rudy's wife wisely opted to return to Germany. The plan was for the brothers to wine and dine the women, getting whatever money they could get out of them. Cheryl and Trudy were two marks, though their connection didn't last long. The brothers soon moved on to meet other women, faking being rich, usually thanks to the money and gifts from previous girlfriends, and then they'd move on again just as quickly. They carried this out for a couple of months before they met Annette and Cindy. It turned out Cindy was the third or fourth woman Michael had started talking marriage to. But she was the only one who said yes. The idea of these short-term con jobs turned into a longer-term plan to marry for money. The way to get the big payout would be to get life insurance on the new wife and then kill her. But they had to wait for the policy to be active. So for the next month or so, Michael, Rudy, and Anka took advantage of the joint marital funds that Cindy provided. The three put down payments on three expensive watches, and they also signed contracts to buy four cars. They told the dealer that they were waiting on money to come from Germany, but the truth was it was coming from the $400,000 life insurance policy that Michael planned on collecting. But there was a wrench thrown in the plan when their insurance agent called in late November. They had been denied the $400,000 policy. They were only able to get a $100,000 one. That wouldn't be enough to cover the money that Michael already spent. But the agent said they could apply for a $300,000 policy from another company that would possibly make up the shortfall. They decided to go ahead and applied for that. So that meant Cindy's life would be spared for a few more weeks while they waited on that policy to be active. And assuming that policy would come through as quickly as the first one did, Rudy and Anka reserved a rental car for December 9th, with Rudy specifically asking for a larger car so that they would have enough trunk space. I'm sure the rental clerk assumed it was for luggage. The life insurance agent called Cindy and Michael and said there was a delay in the policy being issued because they needed some more information. 
Cindy sent that information over, but this meant that the murder had to be delayed, so Rudy canceled that rental car reservation. Cindy and Michael then went to a party on December 11th, at which time they announced to everyone that they had gotten married. While I'm sure a few managed a sincere enough congratulations to them, to say that everyone was shocked would be an understatement. They thought Michael was a boyfriend of two months, not a husband. Cindy's sister Kathy was particularly hurt and upset. And that's in part because it seemed like Michael had been trying to put a wedge between the two anyway, and this was just one more wedge between them. I have to assume that Michael was worried Kathy would be the voice of reason for Cindy and interfere with his plans. At one point, he had even taken to listening in on their conversations so they would switch to speaking Spanish so that he couldn't understand them. If given more time, I think Kathy likely would have gotten through to Cindy to end this sham marriage. But they didn't have that time. On December 22nd, Michael got the call he was waiting for. The second policy, the one for $300,000, had been approved. The very next day, Cindy dropped her car off for some repairs and picked up a rental car. It was just days before Christmas, so Cindy was very busy. She had a bunch of things to get done before she flew back to Illinois the next day to visit with family. She was also planning that day to meet with friends for a late dinner so that they could exchange gifts. Now, while Cindy was busy and distracted that day, Michael, Rudy, and Anka went to pick up their own rental car, again saying they needed one with plenty of trunk space. Michael then went with the other two back to the Motel 6 to go over their plan. Michael was the mastermind, and the other two were going along with the promise of a payday. Michael told the two to meet him in front of a German restaurant around 7 p.m., and he would have Cindy with him. They would then take her out to the desert and kill her there, leaving her body where it would be found. It was important that her body be found quickly so that she was declared deceased and the insurance money could be collected. Once the plan was in place, the three went out to the desert to practice with a crossbow. Cindy was completely unaware of what was being plotted as she packed to go home for Christmas. At about 6.50, she talked to her friend Maria on the phone and confirmed that she and Michael would pick Maria up at 7.45 to head out to that dinner with friends. Maria said she heard Michael arrive home when they were on the phone just before 7 p.m. According to what Anka later told the police, she and Rudy arrived at the German restaurant as planned at 7 p.m. They waited about 15 minutes before they saw Michael drive by without stopping. They didn't see Cindy in the car, but decided to go ahead and follow him in their car. They drove into the desert, and when they got to where they had shot the crossbow earlier in the day, Rudy pulled over, thinking that's where they were going to stop. But Michael kept driving. So Rudy got back on the road and drove a ways to find Michael. According to Anka, Rudy told her to lie down in the car, and then he got out. About 10 minutes later, he got back into the car and they drove both of the cars back to the Motel 6. Rudy and Michael showered and changed their clothes, and then all three headed out to a restaurant at 10.30 p.m. They waited a little while to order their food, saying that they were waiting on someone. And when that person didn't show, they went ahead and ordered. The three then went out to a nightclub, and Michael eventually dropped Rudy and Anka back at the motel around 2 a.m., and then he returned to Cindy's apartment. By this point in the night, though, Cindy's friends were worried. She hadn't picked up Maria for dinner as planned, she didn't show up at the restaurant, and no one could get in touch with her. Kathy had also been trying to reach her sister since they were heading home together the next day, and Cindy was supposed to call so that they could finalize plans. In the morning, Annette got Michael on the phone. He said that he was also worried about Cindy because she left around 7 p.m., supposedly after getting a call from an angry man. All she told him was that she had to go meet someone and would meet him at 10 p.m. at a restaurant, but then she never showed up and she never came home. 
Annette drove over to the apartment to see what was going on. When Annette saw Cindy's purse there, she knew something was wrong because Cindy wouldn't have left without her bag. Annette called the police to report her missing. Michael and Annette both gave their statements, and Michael told the police the same thing that he had told Annette about the phone call. Though a missing persons report was filed, Cindy would not be missing for long. Hours after Annette called the police on December 24th, her body was found in the desert. She was only 30 years old. Cindy had been beaten, stabbed, and her throat had been slashed. Near her body was a length of nylon cord and a blood-soaked beach towel. A search of the scene showed tire tracks near her body, as well as a shoe impression. The shoe impression wasn't just on the ground. On Cindy's face was a partial shoe print, as though her killer or killers had kicked or stomped her after she was on the ground. Because of the unique pattern of the shoe, they were able to narrow it down to a specific type of Reeboks. Michael, being the husband, was of course being looked at from the start. He was asked about his shoes, and he denied that he owned sneakers at all. And as for his alibi, he was with Rudy and Anka the whole time. The police questioned both of them, and they backed up Michael's story, saying that they arrived at the apartment around 7, just as Cindy was leaving. She told them she would meet up with them later, but then never arrived. And the server at the restaurant was able to confirm the time that the three came in and said that they waited to order because they were waiting on someone who never showed. Cindy's body was ready to be released after the autopsy while the investigation continued. Cindy's family wanted her to be brought back to Illinois to be buried where her mother was, But Michael initially refused. He said he wanted to have her body buried in Arizona near him so that he could visit her grave. Mind you, he had no ties to Arizona other than Cindy, but he was insistent. Though Michael was a suspect in the murder, they didn't have the evidence needed to block him from making decisions like this as her next of kin. However, after speaking with her family and making a few negotiations, Michael finally agreed to allow her family to bury her. His conditions included that Cindy be buried in her wedding dress and be buried with a photograph of Michael. Now, the absolute gall of him to insist on these things. I imagine it was all part of his act, so he would be seen as the grief-stricken, loving widower. But it just makes me sick that he had any demands of the family, let alone his picture being buried with her, knowing what we know. On New Year's Eve, Michael, Rudy, and Anka all flew to Illinois for the funeral using funds he had gotten through a loan. Now, it's pretty easy for him to borrow this money since Michael had proof that he was coming into a considerable amount of money from these insurance policies. Michael openly cried at the funeral, though he didn't speak to anyone, with Rudy making excuses for him. He was simply too overcome with grief. But Kathy, Cindy's sister, caught Michael when he thought no one was watching. He was driving away from the funeral with his brother and Anka, and he was laughing. The night of the funeral, the three went out to a nightclub, and according to what Anka later told the police, Michael confessed to her that he was the one who actually killed Cindy while Rudy just stood there. He followed that up by saying that Cindy signed her death warrant when she signed the application for life insurance, but then he started crying, saying that he actually regretted killing her, that no amount of money was worth the guilt he felt. But it was clearly worth trying to get away with it. The three flew back to Phoenix, and then on January 3rd, 1989, they got back on another flight, and this time they went to Los Angeles. They offered a man on the street $20 to call Cindy's number and leave a message. The message he left basically confessed to killing Cindy, and he threatened to kill Michael's girlfriend, his brother, and then Michael if he doesn't get his, quote, stuff. The call ended with the quote, do it now, if not, see what happens. My eyes are everywhere. The three then flew back to Phoenix, and when Michael heard this message on the machine, he called the police. He specifically reached out to a German-speaking detective and asked if he could translate the message for him, 
pretending like he wasn't really sure what it said. Michael played the message over the phone, and the detective told him to bring the tape to the station. Instead of throwing off the police as intended, this message only made them look at Michael more closely. The message sounded like nonsense, and they smelled a distraction. They had already learned about the hasty marriage and the life insurance policies taken out right before Cindy's death, so Michael was their prime suspect. And because Rudy and Anka backed up his alibi, they were also on the police radar. Since all three were German nationals, there was concern that they could flee the country, so they were also put under surveillance. The police hoped they'd at least stick around long enough to try to get the insurance payout, which would hopefully give the investigators the time they needed to build their case. On January 5th, not entirely sure Michael was home and wanting to confirm his location, the police sent a plainclothes officer to knock on the door. Michael answered, and they could confirm that he, Rudy, and Anka were all at the apartment. So the officer just made up a name of someone claiming he was looking for them. Michael said no one lived there, and the officer left. But Michael, thinking he was terribly clever, I'm sure, got an idea from this. Maybe a neighbor could even back up hearing a knocking sound, so Michael called the police. He said that three black men had just come to the door and told the brothers they needed to go to Los Angeles to explain a drug deal, or else. Along with the call from the man in L.A. about getting his stuff, it's pretty clear they were trying to make it look like Cindy's death was related to a drug deal gone wrong. The police knew three men didn't knock on the door because they were watching the apartment and it was their own officer who had knocked. But playing along, they asked all three, Michael, Rudy, and Anka, to come to the station the next day to make composite sketches. And the next day, they did just that. The men were interviewed separately about the men at the door and to get those sketches done. But Anka was left alone in the lobby for a few hours to stew a bit before they interviewed her. The investigators believe that she had less involvement than the two men and was likely the weak link. The brothers were not as likely to turn on each other as Anka was to turn on either of them. And their strategy was right. They told her that she was facing criminal charges, but they could give her full immunity if she told them what she knew. After they confronted her with a photo of Cindy's body, she confessed, mostly. She told them about going to the desert, and she managed to have herself lying down in the car, unable to see anything when the actual murder took place. Her statement very conveniently left her ignorant of the details of what happened to Cindy. But Anka did know there was a plot on her life, and she also knew that Michael attempted to alter evidence. He may have learned about the tire tracks being found at the scene, or he just worried there might be, because the day after Cindy's body was found, Michael took the rental car out to the desert again. He drove the car hard, speeding up and slamming on the brakes, as well as making sharp turns. His hope was that the tread would be changed enough from this erratic driving that the police couldn't match it to what was found at the crime scene. And he did succeed to some degree. After the car was returned, the rental company replaced two of the tires due to the damage to the tread. After Anka's statement, both brothers were arrested while they were still at the station. The police had beat the clock. They managed to get enough probable cause to hold them before the insurance payout and or the trio fled back to Germany. After the arrest, they also got a search warrant for the apartment. They didn't find the Reebok shoes they were hoping to find, but they did find rolls of film that when developed, showed Michael wearing a pair of those Reeboks with a tread like the prints at the crime scene. While the brothers were in pretrial detention, Michael wrote letters to Rudy. The letters were translated into English by the police, and in one letter, Michael told Rudy they would be out in two weeks. Basically, he knew another inmate who was getting out in a few days and had agreed to commit a similar murder. Once a woman was killed in the same way and under the same circumstances as Cindy, but while the brothers were locked up, they would have to be released. He wrote that they would be free and they could collect the insurance money. 
the police wouldn't be able to do anything about it. So Michael was the brains behind this plot, but clearly he had some gaps in his understanding of how things worked. Writing a letter from jail to your suspected co-conspirator, who was also in jail, about your plot to have another person murdered isn't exactly going to exonerate you. But before we get to the legal proceedings, I want to back up and get into who these brothers were and what circumstances led them to become killers as adults. This isn't really a great one to debate nature versus nurture because clearly lack of nurture played a significant role here. Now, these cases are always difficult in some ways as people don't always want to hear what the killers went through. But I do want to say that we can both feel badly for what happened to Rudy and Michael without excusing, even for a second, what they did to Cindy. We can hold both of those things at the same time. A lot of people go through a lot of terrible things and never hurt anyone. But it is important in what comes next to understand their full backstory. The state was going for the death penalty, and in the death penalty, mitigating factors matter. So Rudy and Michael, along with their siblings, grew up under awful conditions. Their father had been a Nazi who turned into an abusive alcoholic and treated his wife and children horribly. Michael was a particular target as he was the youngest of the seven children. After baby number six, his mother went to the doctor to be sterilized. Her abusive husband rarely worked and she could barely feed the children they had. But the procedure didn't work and Michael was born. Michael bore the brunt of his parents' neglect and abuse as he was the unwanted child. And that's how they referred to him to his face. They called him the unwanted one. But that doesn't mean that the other children were spared, particularly the daughters who were also sexually abused. The children in the family would be regularly medicated with sleeping pills so their parents wouldn't have to deal with them, and if that didn't work, they'd be physically tied up. Michael's first documented attempt at suicide came at the age of seven. He had been sexually assaulted by an older man. It wasn't the sexual assault that drove him to that level of despair. It was his fear of his father finding out and what his father would do to him. The second attempt was at 13 after another sexual assault. After the second attempt, it was recommended that Michael be placed in an institution as he was deemed severely mentally disturbed. He wasn't institutionalized, but he was attending a school for those with learning disabilities. His IQ was around 88 as assessed at the age of nine, which isn't super low and wouldn't have normally had him sent to a special school. But with his emotional problems, a regular school couldn't meet his needs. Like his siblings before him, though, he left school around grade nine. It was a demand of his father, who didn't work regularly, that his children leave school and enter the workforce to support him when they turned 14. Rudy had also attended a special education school, but he had been sent there early on. He had been hit by a truck when he was younger, and it caused a severe brain injury. His IQ was estimated to be around 65, which is low. Even when Rudy signed up to do his mandatory military service, he was soon discharged due to his low intelligence. Michael continued to have issues with his mental health, seeking inpatient treatment in 1985 and 1986. At one point, he was married for a few years, but that ended in divorce. And then in 1988, the brothers traveled to the United States to start conning women, though it's unclear exactly why they went to the U.S. It is possible that it was because both brothers had criminal histories in Germany for things like fraud, theft, and burglary. Rudy had even spent five years in prison for a rape conviction, and he was wanted for other crimes in Germany when they went to the U.S., They may have been trying a new country because they were getting caught too often in the old one. But it didn't last long in the United States either. It was only five months after their arrival that they were both in custody for premeditated murder. And like I said, the state was seeking the death penalty in both cases. Michael was going to trial first in mid-April 1990. 
The prosecution's theory of the crime was that the attack on Cindy began at the apartment after she got off the phone with Maria. While still in the apartment, Michael managed to subdue Cindy enough that he could bind her with that cord that was found near her body and possibly even the towel. He put her in the trunk or possibly the floor of the car, and that's why Anka didn't see her when Michael drove by the restaurant they were meeting at. Once in the desert, Michael finished killing Cindy and left her where she was found. Anka was obviously, at this trial, the star witness. Another major witness was a detective who went to Germany to investigate the background of the brothers. Once there, he learned a lot. Of course, Michael's criminal record was uncovered, and also his ex-wife had a lot to say, like how he once attacked another man with a knife. She also said he would do anything for money, including asking her to donate a kidney for payment. The defense was that Michael didn't kill Cindy and that he didn't even have a motive. The larger insurance policy wasn't fully in effect yet because it had barely been approved. So if that was his motive, wouldn't it make sense that he made sure he would get the money before he killed somebody? Beyond that, they argued Michael had an alibi witness who took the stand. This witness was a server at a restaurant in Mesa who testified that she served Michael shortly before 8 o'clock and then again a few hours later. If Anka was telling the truth, this wouldn't have fit in the timeline, but the state said that it wasn't necessarily true. Just because Michael had a drink shortly before 8 didn't mean he was there long. He could have popped in, had a quick drink to set up an alibi, and then left again before coming back later. Or the server could have been mistaken. No solid evidence like a receipt was ever found to put him there around eight. Michael decided to take the stand in his own defense, and he got up there repeating the same story he told Annette and he told the police. He said Cindy got a strange call that evening that made her really nervous. She started chain smoking and told him about the call as he got out of the shower. She said she had to go meet someone to straighten out a problem. Michael said he did ask for more details, like who the person was, who she was meeting with, but Cindy wouldn't tell him. He said that he was her husband now and that her problems were his problems, but Cindy insisted that she would just explain it when she got home, except she never came home. Michael told the jury that he didn't know what happened to Cindy until the police told him they found her body, at which time he became hysterical and fell into a deep depression. To explain some of the evidence against him, Michael said that he did own the Reeboks, but had gotten rid of them weeks before the murder. And the insurance policy wasn't part of a murder plot, but rather because they were planning to have children and they wanted to insure their futures. As for Anka, he said she was just a scorned woman. She was the one who wanted to marry Michael, but he had fallen in love with Cindy instead. So to get back at him, she made up the story to implicate him in the murder. The jury didn't buy it. After six and a half hours of deliberation, Michael was found guilty of premeditated first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. At sentencing, Michael claimed he was innocent and he loved Cindy, but he was still sentenced to death. The day after Michael was sentenced, a Rudy's trial began in mid-August 1990. In this case, the state's position was that Rudy helped plan the murder and that he helped kill Cindy. Even if Michael was the driving force behind the murder, Rudy was just as involved every step of the way. Again, Anka was the star witness, giving consistent testimony to what she had said in Michael's trial. She did say that Michael told her he killed Cindy himself and that Rudy just stood around. Now, Rudy's defense was to throw Michael all the way under the bus. They were saying that Cindy was already dead when Rudy got to the murder scene. They called a forensic pathologist to the stand to explain that Cindy's injuries were more consistent with a single attacker. But this expert did backfire a little bit because he also said the killer was likely right-handed. The issue here is that Michael was left-handed. Rudy was the one who was right-handed. The state had a rebuttal witness who testified that it was inconclusive if there was one killer or two killers or even more. Though only one person stabbed her, it was possible that someone else held her down during the attack. The defense did call a psychiatrist to testify that Rudy had a pattern of doing whatever Michael said with little thought. 
it was at that point in his life almost automatic for him, and it stemmed from his childhood abuse. Rudy would be severely beaten whenever he failed to keep Michael quiet and out of his father's way. So Rudy learned to do whatever Michael wanted because he was conditioned to prioritize making Michael happy and quiet for his own well-being. On August 29th, 1990, the jury decided that Rudy was more involved than he said. They deliberated for two hours before finding him guilty of premeditated first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. At sentencing, Rudy cried and insisted he thought Michael was joking when he said he was going to kill Cindy. He said he wished he believed Michael and talked him out of it, but he continued to claim that Cindy was dead when he got to the desert. He was not believed and was also sentenced to death. And with two death sentences in place, we have two sets of appeals. In 2006, both tried to get their sentences overturned due to their low IQs as they were not brought up during their sentencing phase. No one with an IQ under 70 can be put to death, so both were put under examination by psychologists hired by their appellate attorneys. The state was also allowed to have them assessed by their psychologists. Both men tested with IQs under 65. A hearing was held in 2009 about this. In Michael's case, they also had an IQ score from when he was nine years old that showed he had a low average intelligence and it was definitely not under 65. His side argued that they never would have sent him to a special education school if he actually functioned with an IQ as high as 88, indicating that it was actually probably lower than originally scored. But another expert testified that they suspected Michael was malingering during the intelligence tests in prison and purposely scored low in order to get off death row. They pointed out that Michael had the ability to complete a year of military service, he lived independently, he held down jobs, and he even learned conversational English while the brothers were in the U.S. So his death sentence was upheld. Rudy, however, had a longer documented history of having a low IQ. It began in childhood with that documented head injury and continued through his time in special education his early dismissal from military service, and his inability to live independently. He had always lived with his parents, other family members, including Michael or his wife. Rudy's death sentence was overturned, and he was resentenced to life with parole eligibility after 25 years. In 2015, Michael saw some hope of post-conviction relief when he argued that his dysfunctional childhood should have been presented during his sentencing hearing as a mitigating factor. A district judge agreed, but that ruling was then overturned by the Ninth Circuit Court. I think a major issue for Michael was that his defense at trial and during the sentencing phase was pretty simple. He didn't do it. That was his strategy. If his defense had conceded he was guilty at sentencing and then failed to present mitigating factors, he likely would have had more success with this appeal. But how convincing is it to say, I didn't do it, but if I did, here's why. The repeated appeals and Rudy eventually becoming eligible for parole put such a burden on Cindy's family. Her sister Kathy told journalist Kevin Regan that she almost wished that they would have just given Michael life without parole just to put an end to the appeals and to let the family just put the Apelt brothers in the past. The burden of the parole process did end for the family in April of 2022 when Rudy Apelt died in prison of natural causes. Michael Apelt remains on death row along with about 100 other inmates. Arizona had halted executions after a botched attempt in 2014 when it took Joseph Woods two hours to die after being injected with the drugs. During those hours, he reportedly gasped for air most of the time. Arizona started looking for alternatives to the drug cocktail that caused this issue, and they even considered going back to the gas chamber. But in May of 2022, they started carrying out lethal injections again using pentobarbital. Three men were executed in 2022, and then an anti-death penalty governor was elected, and no further executions have occurred since then. 
Michael has exhausted all of his appeals and should execution start in Arizona again, he will be about one of 20 or so inmates to probably have a date scheduled. I hope that with Michael's appeals exhausted and Rudy's death, that Cindy Monkman's family can finally have a rest. Her sister Kathy has turned to writing to process her own trauma, and she's writing a memoir called Middle Child. And it's not just about her experiences with Cindy and her murder, but other experiences she's had with her younger brother. And it really sounds like it's going to be an incredible and powerful read when it does come out. I'll leave a link to her website in the show notes. It's middlechildbook.com. And you can follow along and buy a copy and read it when it comes out. Thank you for listening. You can find Crime Lines on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and occasionally TikTok. Crime Lines is on Patreon, where I offer early and ad-free episodes, as well as bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash crimelines. If you want to buy me a coffee, the official drink of Crime Lines, you can give a one-time donation at basementfortproductions.com slash support. And if you need a palate cleanser after listening to heavier true crime shows, check out Rusty Hinges, an allegedly funny history, mystery, and true crime show that I co-created and write for. 